welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a chilling survival story on a dark, cold country road. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help us smash our way through the 25,000 subscriber mark by Christmas. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled Surviving Night's Lane. Let's get straight into that. Growing up, me and my friends always found ourselves in a lot of trouble. I mean, we were in an old, small country town, but the woods felt like they extended for hundreds of miles. You know, those towns where supposedly nothing ever happens, but when it does, it's bad. The towns that seem to be the setting of every horror story ever? Yeah, that. And for the most part, it was true. Hardly anything ever happened there. But any time it did, it was bad. Really bad. There was always somewhere to explore, and with five knuckle-headed kids roaming around, a lot of places were discovered. However, there was one place, one place that we dared to enter. One place where we paid the price, and it changed our lives forever. But let's start from the beginning. Five people made up our little group. The rebels. We could have been closer friends despite how different our personalities were. There was me, Cole. The role I played was the one who kept our group from getting ourselves killed. I was essentially the babysitter. And there was Steve, the self-proclaimed badass of the group. The popular and athletic one. And to the rest of us, well, he was simply just an ass, But we loved him nonetheless. And there was Caleb, the funny one, basically. The rest of us were occasionally scared to death of going certain places or doing certain things. Even he was scared shitless. No matter what though, you could rely on him for finding a place for an unnecessary what the fuck joke. Next, we have Robert, the good kid. From the time we met all the way up to sixth grade, Robert didn't attend one mission with us. We were all close, but any time we were going somewhere dangerous or doing something we could get hammered over, you could count him out. Eventually, he got tired of being left out and he started to come along. The last but not least of our group is Asher, the leader of us all. He had a little bit of us all in him, and in most cases, he did it better. He was funny, he was brave, he watched over us, and most importantly, he was my best friend. I mean, sure, we all were very close and watched over each other like family, but you have to admit, even in a family, you have a favourite. We were all a group, but we had our own groups within us. Usually, it was me and Asher, Steve and Caleb, and Robert just latched on to whichever one of our groups went the safest route. And now that you know us, it's time for the real story. The story of what happened to us in the summer of 1985. The summer that changed how we looked at life. School had just let out about a week before. It was the summer of our seventh grade year. And we were happy as we could be. The summer heat matched with the smell of the country air and the most important thing, no school. It was every kid's dream, us included. We all lived pretty close to each other. On our bikes we could make it to each other's house in five minutes or less. It's one of the reasons we became so close. There was no other kids on our road besides us and maybe three or four others. But they were much younger than us. We were over at Ash's house in his backyard, thinking of what our first quest would be for the summer. How about we go see Rambo? It comes out this weekend, Robert suggested. Uh, don't be a wuss, Rob. It's the first week and quest of summer vacation, and you want to see a movie, Steve said. It's rated R. We have to sneak in and not get caught. Perfect for a quest, Robert replied. Yeah, perfect for a wimp like you. The two went back and forth for about a minute as me and Asher stared on. Both of us looked at each other with the looks of disappointment that they're into it again. After those two settled down a bit, Steve stood up and rested his leg on the tree stump he was sitting on. How about we go to some place scary, he suggested. No thanks, I was in your mum's bed already this week, Caleb blurted out. I hid his arm and told him to shut up and listen. Go on, Asher said to Steve. You know, that old house on Knight's Lane, the Crane House, he said while looking around at all of us. 
Are you mental? That's at least half an hour from here. And you know the stories about that place, I said immediately. Yeah, so? We've been gone for hours at a time before. What's the difference? And those are just stories to keep kids away, Steve responded. The difference was that if we had to get home fast, we could do so, Asher interrupted. And that house is far out. Being gone for a long time is different than being far from home. While Asher was talking, Caleb stood up and walked over to where Steve was. Oh, come on, guys. It's the first quest of the summer. We have to go big. Let's try something new, Steve smirked and nodded his head in agreement. It's the first quest, not the last. Why go big the first time? Robert asked. The three looked at me. I shrugged my shoulders and looked at Asher. I could see both points of view. It didn't matter to me. So we have two that say yes and one that says no, and two neutrals, Asher said as he stood up. Fine, let's do it, he said. How'd I know you'd say that? Forget it, I'm not going, Robert said. He was clearly pissed off. That wasn't the first time we'd heard him say that though. So we know where we're going. The question is, when are we going? I said as I stood up to join the rest of them. We looked at each other blankly. Steve took his foot off the stump and walked away from us and came back. Let's go at night, he said. Yeah, whatever you're taking, I want some too, Caleb said. I would take some too, but I don't want to be absolutely insane like you, Robert added. At night, Steve? What is wrong with you? I asked. Asher was looking at Steve as well. What's the point in going somewhere scary if we're going to go with the sun beaming down on us? Steve asked, obviously trying to convince us. No way, Steve, Robert said as he sat back down. Against my better judgement, I kind of agreed with Steve. I mean, it's summer. We're a bunch of hard-headed, adventurous kids. Why not go the extra mile? We're already in over our heads anyway, I thought. Apparently, I had my thoughts written all over my face. Steve looked right at me and asked, You know I'm right, don't you, Cole? I looked up at him and then looked back down, not answering, but making my answer well known. Guys, seriously? Said Asher, getting all of our attentions. There's no way you're serious about this. You know what happened in that house. And it's 30 minutes away from here. At night. Our parents told us to cut this out. Need I remind you? If we get caught all the way out there, we're dead. Tell me you're kidding, he said. Robert looked at me and Steve, and I looked at Caleb as I saw his face change. He was intrigued as well. They're serious, Robert said to Asher. What night would this plan take place? Steve asked Asher. Do you really have to ask that? Our parents know we're all here tonight. Your mum goes to sleep early. What other night will we go? Steve said, shrugging his shoulders. We all looked at each other with our, at this point, signature blank faces. Asher crossed his arms and paced back and forth. And when he stopped, he came back to the circle. It's too risky, guys, he said. Steve basically threw a fit. Asher, what the hell, man? Grow a pair, he said aggressively. I'll grow a pair as soon as you grow a brain, idiot. Just let me think, Asher responded. After a moment, he looked as if the idea of the century popped into his head. He walked over to Robert and sat down. Can we ask you a favour, bro? Asher asked. Robert didn't respond, but he was looking right in Asher's eyes. I really need you to go tonight. If I go and my mum comes in the room, we're all in trouble. But if I'm here, I can at least cover for you guys. I want to go with them, but I can't. I know you don't want to, but it'll really help out. We'll make it up to you, I promise. Asher said with a reassurance in his voice. We all know Robert wanted to say no. But we also know that Robert wanted to have his moment. Asher had his when they were in the woods one day and he had to make a jump from ditch to ditch to get Robert help when he twisted his ankle. The ditches were very far in between and I don't think he even knew if he could make it or not, but he did. Steve had his moment when one day a kid was getting bullied at school. He took matters into his own hands. We weren't around and yet Steve still stuck up for the kid who was getting tormented by three older guys. He lost the fight, of course, but it showed that beyond his ego, he really had a heart. Caleb had his moments when he did a skit with a kid for the school talent show. 
The kid's partner bowed on him and Caleb improvised a whole skit with him. The whole school laughed and talked about it for weeks after. I had my moments when I single-handedly took the blame for breaking our neighbor's window with a baseball. We were already walking on thin ice. I took the blame regardless. But Robert hasn't had his moment yet. He knew it was his turn to take one for the team, especially to repay Asher for helping get the help he needed. His ankle was still messed up ever since the incident. But if he tried to walk on it more, or jump a ditch, it would have been way worse. <sighs> yeah, fine. I'll go, he said regrettably. We all got up and patted him on the back. It's going to be fun, I promise, Steve said. After this, we gathered our wits and headed into Ash's house. We usually worked over our plans in the basement, and we for sure needed a plan this time. This was absurd. But if only we knew, then how absurd it would be. Alright, so we leave at 9-ish and we'll be back about 11, I asked the group. They all nodded their heads in agreement. If you guys aren't back by then, I'm going after you. There's no telling what's there and it's trespassing, Asher said. We were about to leave and so we checked over our supplies. We had a watch, some water bottles and a flashlight. I felt a tingling in my stomach I was starting to feel a little bit off about this whole situation. I knew that maybe this wasn't such a good idea, but I didn't want to say anything. I'm sure we all felt like this. Even Steve wasn't looking super enthusiastic about it anymore. We all left out of the basement and crept through the house to get to the front door. We opened it as quietly as possible and went to the front lawn. If my mum finds out, I'll try to cover for you guys. i tell her you all went home because... I was starting to feel sick. She shouldn't call your parents, but if she does, I tried to stall her for as long as possible, Asher said to us after we were grabbing our bikes. She shouldn't suspect anything. She knows we all go as a group. With you staying behind, I'm sure it'll go smoothly, Steve said. We all headed out and set off in our destination. The ride there was hmm, quiet. We mostly were listening for wild dogs or something in the woods. We also had to make sure that if we saw car lights, we could duck off out the way of them. We were focused, like explorers setting out to new lands. After about 20 minutes, we came across Knight's Lane street sign. I always knew you were bonkers, Steve, but you proved it tonight, Caleb said. Shut up, Caleb. I said while looking at our surroundings. I'm just saying. Roberts, who didn't say a word for the whole way, even let out a chuckle. We rode about five or six minutes past the sign when Steve told us to stop. We weren't at the house yet though, so we wondered why. You guys hear that? He asked while looking around. We all got quiet and listened closely, but I didn't hear anything. I don't hear anything. I think that's the sound of the emptiness in your head, Caleb said. I'm serious guys, listen, Steve demanded. He was serious, I could tell, but no one else heard anything. What does it sound like, Steve? I asked. He didn't respond. He just looked. He was staring at something ahead of us, something I myself couldn't see. I called his name a few times, but he didn't respond. At that point, I got off my bike and walked over to him and placed my hands on his shoulder. He almost jumped out of his body. It was like he was in a trance. Whoa, are you okay, man? I asked. He looked at my face, and I saw he looked really worried. He looked back to the rest of the guys. I think maybe we should turn around, he said. We're already here. We just risked our parents' wrath. You want to turn around before we even get there? Caleb asked. Steve looked back at the house ahead of us. I'm sorry, guys. I'm going back home, Steve said. Me and Robert were already turning our bikes around too. We were perfectly fine with going back. I had a weird feeling about this. We turned our bikes and Steve followed. But as we were about to leave, Caleb darted in the direction of the house. Caleb, what the hell? I shouted. He kept pedalling and didn't respond. I'll go get him. You two go back home. We shouldn't be far behind you, I said. Steve looked worried. I can't leave you guys there. It was my idea, he said. Oh, we're not going in. I'm just going to go get him and we'll be right back with you. Steve faced his bike towards the house. Then we'll go get him together. There's something not right, Cole, he said. We both headed towards the house and told Robert to go home. 
We knew how much he didn't want to be here in the first place. Yeah, but I don't want to ride back alone either. I'll just stick with you, he said. We didn't have much time to argue. We all went to the house and set our bikes on the side, out of the street's view. We saw Caleb's bike, but not Caleb. We walked around the side of the huge house and didn't see him at all still. Knowing him, he's probably hiding, waiting to jump out and scare us. Come out, Caleb. We're not doing this. We're, we're going home, I yelled. There was no response. When we walked back to our bikes, we heard a loud thud. We ran around the front of the house and saw the door. It was wide open. There's no way he went in there, Robert said. We all looked at each other and we knew what we had to do. We didn't want to, though. But we were not leaving Caleb in there. He could have got himself arrested for trespassing if he was caught. We had to go in and get him immediately. Steve looked at the door with the same worry I saw earlier. He let out a, damn it, and we all knew what we had to do. We walked up to the porch, the planks on the porch cracking and creaking. The door was wide open. This is the first time we'd seen the inside and it didn't look as bad as we imagined. That said though, it was pitch black inside and the only light was provided by the moon above. We all stood at the door. It was a blast of cold air that hit us as we took a step in. You first, I said as I bumped Steve. He looked back and then walked further into the house. At this point I felt an overwhelming feeling of grief. It was just something wrong with this house. I couldn't shake it off. I walked behind Steve and was nervous beyond belief. Robert still didn't say one word. He walked behind me. Caleb, where are you? I called out quietly. Seriously, Caleb, cut the shit, Steve said. There was still no response. We called him a few more times with no change. Where are the flashlights? Steve asked. I checked my pockets and even though I knew I couldn't fit a flashlight, I knew where they were. I just didn't want to believe it. Steve stopped and asked again. Robert patted around his pockets too, maybe for the same reason. Caleb has them, I said and heard Steve let out a sigh. Oh, of course he does. Almost as soon as Steve said that, we heard a creak in the floorboards in front of us. I looked up and what I saw made my heart drop to my stomach. It was a figure standing there in front of us in the dark. To this day, I don't know exactly how to describe it. At the time though, my child mind didn't know what to think. I was scared, of course, but I was also pissed at Caleb. I noticed it first and stepped back quickly, making me and Robert fall. Steve was already looking at the figure. That's it, he said softly. He walked back from it, coming closer to us. I just stared for what seemed like hours. I was frozen. I was cold. But I was sweating. Something clicked in my mind, though. We didn't see Caleb this whole time. I then looked back up at the figure and heard a chuckle this very moment. <laughs> Caleb, you punk, I said as I stood up. Do you think this is funny? We could get in serious trouble and you're playing games. He didn't answer. Pissed off at my friend's incompetence, I started to walk towards him and Steve grabbed my arm and pulled me back. That's not Caleb, he said. As soon as Steve said that, we heard footsteps running behind us. Guys, Caleb exerted. Immediately I felt a strong grip around the back of my neck. It had me. I tried to fight it off, but it was too strong. I was choking. Help me, I was trying to say, but couldn't get the words out. Steve tried to rush in, but the man hit him and he smacked into the wall. I couldn't do anything. The grip was so strong that it drove me to my knees. The little light I saw started to go black. I couldn't breathe. Caleb and Robert tried next to do something. Robert tried to get his hand from around my neck and while he was distracted, Caleb grabbed a plank of wood and tried to hit him. He swung and the board broke into a dozen small pieces. I felt them shower over my head. The grip let go, but I couldn't move. I still couldn't see and I was gasping for air. I looked behind me and saw the figure bending down and Steve was just now getting up. It was my chance, but I still couldn't move. I told him I was coming and to get out. Caleb made it out the door. Robert was trying to get me up and Steve was making a break for the door as well. As soon as Steve got out, me and Robert were behind him when the door suddenly swung shut. Guys, are you okay? I heard Steve ask quietly from the other side as Robert tried forcing it open. We're fine, but the door's jammed. We can't get out. 
Robert whispered. Still trying to gain my composure, I saw the figure start to stand back up. I tugged on Robert's shirt to get him to look, and he gestured for me to follow him. We silently crept around the floor, trying to not even make a squeak in the floorboards. We ended up sitting under a long table with our legs crossed to avoid being seen. I have never been more scared in my life. The next two or so minutes was us trying to be as quiet as possible. With every footstep we heard in the dark, our heartbeats grew faster and faster. There was no way we were getting out of this without confronting the man. There was a back door, but it was pitch black and we didn't know the way around the house enough to risk it. We didn't have much time. The footsteps slowed, but they were getting closer and closer. I looked over at Robert. He was looking under the table for the man's feet. He looked up at me and leaned closer to my face. I want you to make a run for it, Cole. Get out and get help, he said. It sounded like he was about to cry. What about you? I asked him. He didn't respond. How do we get out of here? The door is jammed, I said. The footsteps started again and we could now see the man's feet under the table. I will distract him. Just, just figure it out, Robert said. He was terrified. I heard it in his voice. The man was now directly beside the table. It was over. We had to act now or never. The man's boots turned to us and we were about to dart out. Just as we built up the will, a window broke and the man turned around to it. Now! Robert shouted. We lifted the table up and threw it towards the man, hoping to cause him to trip. We failed and he grabbed Robert's arm. I started to run back to help. It was then when I finally heard the sound that still has me shaken to this day. His voice. I stopped in my tracks while I watched Robert struggle to release from his grasp. Cease your movement, he said with a raspy voice, and it seemed to echo through the house endlessly. I, again, was frozen solid. Robert also stopped moving and looked up to the cloaked figure. Another loud thud came from the front door as it swung open. Caleb and Steve rushed in and the figure grabbed Robert by his neck and lifted him up. I just watched. I couldn't do anything. Steve and Caleb stopped beside me and Robert kicked his legs in extreme effort. What do you want? Steve yelled at the man. His hooded face turned to us and once again his voice filled the room. You, he said as I heard a loud crack extend throughout the room. Robert's legs stopped kicking. We all flinched as we heard the pop and Robert dropped to the ground and the man walked towards us. I heard Steve let out a cry of rage as we bolted to the door. Once we got there, we saw Asher in the yard. What happened, guys? He shouted. He ran a few feet to meet us on the porch and immediately Steve fell to his knees, gagging and coughing. We helped him to his feet. We looked behind us and there was nothing. No footsteps. No man. No Robert. Asher and Steve were out on the front lawn, and Steve sat down once again. Asher looked at us. Where's Robert? I didn't meet him on the way up here, he said. At the time, we didn't know what happened to Robert either. We know what could have happened, but we didn't want to think that way. Steve looked up at Asher, and then looked back down. Asher looked at the house and started to walk towards it. Asher, don't go in there. It's too late. I let out unintentionally. He stopped and looked back at me. Too late? He asked. Steve started to vomit and Caleb was looking towards the street with his hands on his head. I had to say it. He's... he... I started to say. He's what? Asher yelled at me. The tears started to stream down my face. Asher went to the door and opened it. He was greeted by... Robert. Robert! I yelled and Steve and Caleb ran closer to the porch too. I thought he looked fine originally, just dirty. Asher put his hand on his shoulder, and just as he'd done earlier. Are you okay? He asked. Robert nodded his head. I noticed something was off. His head was leaned slightly to the side. He had this emotionless expression on his face. He was just there. It was strange. Asher had his hand on his shoulder up until they went down to the porch. It was then when Robert stopped. Asher looked back up at him and asked what was wrong. He just looked down at the ground and shook his head. No. I 
I felt uneasy once again and I told Asher to come back closer to us. He just held up his finger to signal to us to wait. He reached his hand back out to help Robert down the porch. I saw the man's outline come out the door and I yelled to Asher. Robert grabbed his arm and held him as the man walked closer. Me and Caleb attempted to run and to help but we couldn't step up the porch. Something was stopping us. It wasn't like a wall but it was like our minds just told us not to go near the house. We were frozen solid again, just like in a house. Asher screamed and struggled to get free but he had him and walked in the house and the door swung shut once again. The three of us just watched the door. We stood there all of ten seconds before we heard the most horrific scream of our lives. And then it was silent. We didn't even try to go in the house. We got on our bikes and pedaled faster than we ever had before. We went straight to the police station and told them what happened. The sheriff told us to wait at his desk while he consulted with the others behind the door. We all just looked at each other, sick to our stomachs. Worried. Scared. I figured we wouldn't have too much time to talk after this, and so I asked Caleb where he was. He told me that once he entered the house, he saw nothing. It was too dark, but he heard footsteps on the other end of the house. He heard our voices outside and heard the footsteps come closer to him. So he hid, just like me and Robert did. But once he heard us in the house, he joined up with us. And Steve didn't say one word, though, through Caleb's story. The sheriff told us that our parents were on their way to come and get us. And they were sending a team to check out the house for our friends. Well, fast forward to now and I can tell you they didn't find anything. There was no trace of Asher nor Robert. In fact, the only thing they found was our backpack full of supplies. But Robert got what he wanted. His moment. He had the biggest one of us all. He saved our lives. Me and my parents moved away before school started back up, and up until the move, I was grounded the whole summer. I hadn't heard from Caleb since that night at the station, but I heard he died in a car crash sometime during high school. Even though I wasn't there anymore, I know that later that year, Steve committed suicide. I can only assume it was from guilt, and to this day, I still don't know what happened to my friends. The cops didn't find anything. But I know they're still in that house though. I'm going home for the first time in 30 years. Hopefully, I'll find some answers. What I do know is that I never had friends again like I had when I was 13. Five of us went into that house, three of us came out, and one of us survived. And that one was me. Wow, wow, absolutely chest pumping, uh, intense, now biting action there. Thank you so much to the author, Rosie Reese. Um, wonderful stuff, brother. Thank you so much for your permission to uh, narrate your story. And of course, your patience for me getting it on the show. <laughs> As ever, guys, you know the drill. Please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really, really does help with the channel and our community further. Help us spread our message. Help us gain a bit of traction. Help us create a bit of buzz. As ever, of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear and be safe, not sorry. I hope you're all well and happy and having a wonderful working week. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>